We're so glad to see you all here. I'm Shelley Cohen Conrad, the director of the Center for Excellence in Collaborative Education, which is our interprofessional hub here at the University of New England. And I'm so pleased to introduce and to open this event, Health, Healthcare, and Aging in Prison. We have a remarkable panel of presenters um, that you will see in just a minute how incredible it is. I want to um, mention first that neither the presenters nor planners disclose a commercial or conflict of interest associated with this learning activity. Um, I also want to take just a minute to thank some of the people in the background here. They're not so much in the background, but you'll see them on the screen here, but Chris Hall and Michelle Cody and uh, Dave De De Diego and Lee Cody, who are our logistical wizards here who have made all of this possible, believe me. Um, I also wanna give a thanks to the social work triad team. And finally, a very, very special thank you to you, Peggy of CCSME who has helped to make today possible. So thank you all. And that, I probably haven't thanked everybody. So thank you everybody who has helped with today. So it is my distinct pleasure um, to introduce Commissioner Randall Liberty. Um, Commissioner Liberty has been more than, I, I hope you don't mind me saying this, 36 years of experience in fields of corrections and law enforcement. He's worked in the main state prison system and he's done some remarkable, remarkable work uh, to reduce recidivism, to enhance programming, education and vocational training. And as you'll hear today, he has done incredible work with all of these folks on the screen who you'll be hearing from creating program for those who are aging in prison, those who are dying in prison and beyond. And I, can I mention Commissioner Liberty that you also have great skill with bees and gardening. So we're, we wanna welcome you here. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, thank you, Shelley. And, and uh, actually, I, I hit 40 in August, 40 years in, in the industry. So um, it's been a it's been a wonderful career, and I look forward to many more years. And thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you um, today. I think that this is a great opportunity for us to share with you the world of the Maine Department of Corrections. To many, it's a mystery, and we only know of corrections of what we see on TV or read in the papers. And um, I think you'll be impressed with the team that we have uh, today. Um, it's really a great opportunity for us to learn from each other. And um, as we talk, as, as you have an opportunity to listen to the panels and, and engage with the in individuals uh, speaking today, you'll see that we have a fantastic team and well path. They're an integrated healthcare provider. And I could be I'm more pleased with the work that they do and the difference that they make in many, many lives uh, here in the state of Maine. At the Department of Corrections, we believe in redemption, and uh, we believe that it's our job to identify what brought people to corrections. These, these folks are, are Mainers, and most of them will be released at some point. And really the question is, is will they be better um, citizens, sons, daughters, uh, parents when they're released than when they arrived? And, and we certainly hope so, and, and we've dedicated our professional lives to do that. At the Maine Department of Corrections, we have approximately 1,600 residents in our care. And they fall into, they, they reflect society. We have, uh, we have youth, we have women, we have men. And really the focus of the discussion today is, is about elders and elder care. And, uh, but we'll cover a wide range of, of topics today. Many of our folks uh, in our care, residents, um, have, been, uh, have not received adequate health care. Um, while they're in the, in the communities, they're most vulnerable in many, different, in many ways. And um, they have behavioral health issues. Um, they have addiction issues. Um, many medical issues, and so it's challenging uh, industry to work in. And so it's very appropriate for the 11 healthcare um, professions that are represented by UNE today to have these conversations and uh, to consider possibly a career um, in correctional medical um, um, work as they, as they graduate. Couldn't be any more pleased than with, with Dr. Ali, uh, one of the best um, physicians I've ever worked with um, to work in this space, a compassionate um, dedicated professional that provides um, equal level of care to those residents uh, in our facilities as you would on the outside. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Brooke Berard and, and uh, Melissa Comenti who will be here talking about substance use disorder and the work that we're doing there. We all know that in the state of Maine that we had uh, 
um, 636 overdose death last year. So it's a focus of ours. It's a focus of the governors to address those issues. And they'll talk about the universal access to substance use disorder treatment. And um, I just look forward to that. But I think a, a really a special um, opportunity for you will be able to speak to um, Leo Hilton, who's a friend of ours and he's incarcerated. He and I go back a long ways and, and uh, the significant transformation that he's made while in our care is remarkable. And we were talking earlier that um, from the Maine State Prison, he's teaching a class at Colby College. Think about that. Think about that growth and the, the amazing groundbreaking nation leading work that we're doing there to change lives. And so I'd just like to, again, welcome you. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thank all the WellPath professionals for speaking today. And I'd also like to extend an invitation to anyone on this call at any given time that would like to tour one of the facilities, whether it be their focus for youth, for women, for, for adult males, maximum, minimum, whatever you'd like to do, please reach out to us. We'd love to give you a tour. Thank you. So thank you, Commissioner Libby, that, Liberty. That was incredible. And I will say that visiting Mountain View was a life-changing experience for me. And I know for some of the folks on the call, so I'm really excited to have you all here. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our host, our hostess, Ruth Lawson Stops, and it is certainly a sincere pleasure to tell you a little bit about her. She's the Director of Medical Services for the Maine Department of Corrections. Her career has focused on health, healthcare, health policy, program development and management, and that really doesn't tell you all about Ruth because she has a vast experience. It's due to the successes in these areas that she meets her professional goal and I think some of us, all of us can resonate with this to be, to do good in the world. It's been a real pleasure to work with you, Ruth, and I welcome you to introduce our talks today. Thank you very much, Shelley. And it's so, I think it's so special for all of you to be able to hear from our commissioner. Um, a few things I wanna say is that, um, you know, I, I am pleased to be working at the Department of Corrections. I was in this similar position 10 years ago, left, and I am very pleased to be back. It is a um, great place to work, and it is really quite fulfilling. It's hard work, but, you know, what good work isn't? Um, so a few things I want to say before we get into the rest of the talk. Um, the Department of Corrections has contracted, as the commissioner said, with WellPath. WellPath is a um, national corrections medicine company. They, we are just very pleased to be contracted with them. Their work is excellent. And um, we contract with them to provide all of our medical, dental, and behavioral health services. So you will be hearing from many of those people today and um, a couple of other things. Please keep in mind, this is an overview. You know, there's so much detail that we'd love to go into, and it's a real tease for all of us because there's so much more we would like to say, but it really, we're just sort of skimming the top here today. Um, the figures that I use will be from about a week ago, and at that time we had 1,590 adult residents, um, and we will be focusing on adults today. At that time, I believe we had 26 juvenile um, residents. So, and the, the last thing before we get into the slides is you'll find that we speak about residents. We do not speak of the people who are entrusted to our care um, as inmates or prisoners, they are residents. And we find that that, you know, that really changes the perspective and it's very important. So with that, um, Chris, could you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, we have just revised our mission statement. We're very proud of it. And it is, as you can see, making our community safer by reducing harm through supportive interventions, empowering change and restoring lives. Our core values, accountability, respect, integrity, teamwork, and commitment. What could be better, right? So we have several facilities around the state. As you can see, I'm not gonna go through all of this, but our facilities stretch from South Portland, Maine, where our juvenile facility is, to Wyndham, up to um, Charleston, northwest of Bangor, and um, over to Warren and Machias Port. So, and all of those facilities are different, different custody level, have different custody levels, um, security levels. Most of the people who we have with us, um, residents with us, work. And um, so it's, it's a variety of activities going on in a variety of places. 
adding up to, as I said, about 1,590 adults. So just as a little bit of background, the state of Maine has the highest median age in the country. We come close to Vermont, but so we are a state of older adults, which is the coined term now. But we do know the chronologic age does not reflect physiologic or functional age. And in corrections, an older or elderly resident has nationally been accepted to be about 50 years of age. Sounds young to many people, but um, you know, when residents come to us, you know, they have had hard lives. And it's not easy living in prison, no matter how hard we try to normalize that experience. So people do age a little faster. And um, we do have a resident who is here with us today. And Leo, I, you know, this is probably not a surprise to you, but it is hard. Um, so next slide, please. So in Maine, of the 1,590 um, residents that we have, 337 of them are over the age of 50. And as I said, that is considered to be an older adult, elderly in our system. Of that 337, there are 50 that are over 50 years old. We have 152 or about 45% who, um, who will be with us um, at the very least into their 70s. And when we look at that spread of ages, that's much higher in the latter years of life. So. So functional decline, these are general statements, but functional decline is more rapid among the incarcerated population as is cognitive decline. Along with aging comes a decrease in mobility and the inability to perform activities of daily living. Um, and nationally, I mean, there, there's always a cost to things and it would be foolish to not just at least to recognize that. And nationally, the cost of housing an older resident is twice that of a younger resident due to many factors but largely due to substantial healthcare costs. And that's, that's the case for any of us as we get older. Um, so next slide, please. So quickly the numbers, and I will wrap up here. Um, the numbers, 1,590 adult residents, 335 over the age of 50, greater than 50 is considered older elderly. 106 of those are expected to be with us for the rest of their lives. We do have resources and we work hard at trying to meet the needs of everyone who, who lives with us. We have a 28 bed assisted living unit at the Mountain View Correctional Facility with trained residents offering helping hand services. Um, I will say I was recently at a national meeting. Um, most states do not have something like an, an assisted living unit. So we're very proud of that. Um, hospice services are offered by trained residents in the infirmary at the Maine State Prison. You'll have the opportunity to hear about that in a moment. The infirmary is um, at the Maine State Prison, prison and there we have eight beds there. And that's for residents with significant health care needs. It's not a hospital, but it's you know a step down from that. And we're able to address significant health care needs there. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. John Newby. Um, Dr. Newby is our, the regional vice president for WellPath, and he'll be able to talk with you. He can say a little bit more about himself, which is very interesting. He has a long background in corrections and is very committed to this work, um, but he can talk with you about just who the team is. So John, thank you for being here. Great. Hey, and thank you, uh, Ruth, uh, so much for that introduction and certainly that overview. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to let you know how incredibly honored I, I am to participate in this hosted event covering the important topic of healthcare and aging in corrections. Um, this is a very important uh, topic. And uh, one thing uh, just to note for everyone is that uh, you can't prevent aging. And like time, no matter where you find yourself, uh, it's going to happen. So it's no different um, uh, in a correctional environment. So I find this particular topic of interest, um, as most of our society, at least here in the United States, really don't bother to think about how aging is treated in a prison type setting. Um, so pay attention uh, to the presentations today. Um, there's some real eye-opening information that's gonna be shared. Um, I also think it's important to note that during the course of this, um, this presentation today, 
that you just keep in the back of your mind and note that at least here in the United States, there's a steady increasing um, aging population who are incarcerated. And as uh, Ruth and the commissioner uh, mentioned earlier, uh, some of these individuals may in fact actually be spending the rest of their lives um, with us. So it's so very important for us to care for these individuals. They are human beings and um, it's our job and responsibility as healthcare professionals uh, to provide the best care that we can for them. Um, as Ruth mentioned, I'm Dr. John Newby. I'm the regional vice president for WellPath here in Maine. And uh, my background a little uh, here, I'm actually a podiatric physician and surgeon uh, by training, and I now work as a correctional healthcare senior administrator uh, here. Um, I moved here uh, from um, actually Tennessee, so Maine was quite an eye-opening experience for me, but I truly enjoy uh, and love working in the state of Maine. Um, uh, I've personally been involved in correctional medicine for just over 20 years, and it's a true calling of sorts, um, particularly for individuals working in this industry. Um, most approach this with a real passion and commitment to helping change the lives of many who in society would just have thrown away. WellPath provides um, medical and behavioral health services to the great state of Maine, Maine Department of Corrections, and we employ well over 160 uh, professionals here in Maine, consisting of um, physicians, psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, psychologists, behavioral health professionals, uh, CNAs, medical assistants, all sorts of administrative support staff. And we do this all over the country. It's a wide array, array of services that we actually provide. Uh, and people would be um, surprised to learn that we actually provide oral surgery. We provide um, uh, optometry services. Um, we provide physical therapy. I, this is just um, a highlight of some of those services that um, that we uh, provide here, and I'm sure that we'll be speaking a little bit more on those uh, during the course of our uh, presentation. Um, what I want to kind of wrap up um, here with is just letting you know that if uh, any of you are so inspired uh, as to hear more um, about what it is that we do, um, at the end of this presentation um, will be my contact information, so I encourage you certainly to reach out. Uh, to me directly if you're interested in learning more about this unique opportunity that we have, not only for here in Maine, but across the United States, um, and the possibility of even joining our team here. I mean, these are dedicated uh, healthcare professionals, um, and I'm truly proud and honored to be part of this and uh, contribute to the great works that are being done here. Uh, so um, I'll just kind of turn this back over to you, Ruth. Um, there's a listing of um, the healthcare professionals that, that we have, again, just highlighting uh, some of those. Uh, so certainly I'll uh, make note of those uh, there. And again, I uh, just mentioned that um, this is an exciting opportunity truly um, uh, for you. I mean, I've been in it for so long now, I haven't looked back, uh, it's just great. So Ruth, I'll turn it back over to you at this time. Thank you so much. Let me, um, I, this is my opportunity to introduce Leo Hilton. Um, Leo has done so much. As you heard, he's co-teaching a course at Colby College. He has been active in many groups at the, um, at the prison, um, but one of those, and there's so much we could say, but we're trying to keep everything as brief as possible. And, um, but one of the groups that he's been very involved with is the um, volunteer hospice program at the Maine State Prison. Um, I've had the um, pleasure of meeting with those gentlemen. And um, I, I left just, my goodness, my heart was sort of quivering listening to all of them. Um, they are fantastic. And I think that we could have no better person um, to be able to speak with us about that experience than Leo. So Leo, thank you so much for being here. Um, as you unmute yourself, I will just say that the connection unfortunately is not great. We may have to, um, you know, cut the video connection in order to be able to hear Leo better. I'm hoping it works. So Leo, welcome. It's great to see you. Great to see you too. Great to be here. Thank you. Great. So Leo, um, I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit about the hospice program at the prison. It's a little bit different than um, in, in the community. So yeah, so um, in the interest of time, I will keep my responses unfortunately short because I could talk all day about no. um, because it is different when people think of hospice, 
they tend to think of the end of life, that that's all it is, the last six months of a terminal illness. But hospice at the Maine State Prison is much more encompassing than that. We provide companionship care and we provide uh, palliative care, whether someone is in the infirmary healing from a broken bone or recovering from an infection, or they are at the end of their life We in the hospice program are there to be with them, to be present, and to help them through and help them heal or help them transition through whatever um, stage and whatever struggle they're dealing with. So what brought you into this, Leo? There's a lot of things you could be doing with your time. You could be doing nothing with your time. But um, so what, what brought you into this? What brought me into this is a need for hope a need to serve that I lost hope when I entered the system. And there were two older men who really had an impact on me positively. And I was with them, not as a hospice volunteer, but to see the care and the compassion and the love that was shown by the men who were hospice volunteers let me know that there is space for me to serve in a way that I did not think would ever be possible again. Well, um, so what does it mean to you to be doing this work? It means freedom. It means joy. It means love. It means tenderness and vulnerability and everything that you don't see in prison and everything that is counter to the very existence of prison is what is made possible through hospice. It, it is, it's, it's liberating. I'm able to be all of who I am, all of the best parts of myself and be able to be there and to learn in a way that just isn't possible anywhere else. So it means everything to me. Leo, how many um, hospice volunteers do you have? Right, I think we're down to about eight or nine. Uh, We did just hold an informational and we are looking to do another training session. And we already have applications submitted. And I just have to say the opportunities I've had to meet with your group you know, were quite extraordinary. The commitment that all of you have to be um, doing the very best you can um, is is remarkable. And um, I certainly look forward to continuing to work with you. So thank you very much for taking this time today. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. And um, with that, um, Shelly, I think it's, uh, you're up. I think I am up to introduce the breakout sessions, but I just have to say what a remarkable conversation that was. Thank you, Leo and Ruth, so very much. So I'm here to introduce the breakout session that uh, we'll have now. And um, of course, as always, we want everyone in the breakout rooms to introduce yourselves to each other. And if you are active in um, learning about or practicing a profession, please uh, tell each other what you do. And what we really wanna have you talk about is what have you taken away so far from this presentation? I've seen a lot in the chat about a lot of folks never being introduced to this topic of corrections health. Um, And so we just want you to have some time to talk about that. What are you learning? What what is there for you? Um, And then be ready to share your impressions in the chat when you return, you may wanna have someone volunteer to take notes or just be willing to Um, speak up or put your notes in the chat. So again, introduce yourselves, what's your profession and what have you taken so far? And so I pass it on so that folks can go into their um, breakout rooms. I hope you're all ready to share in the chat. Please feel free to share in the chat right away about what you took from your group and what quest. I know we had a great introductory conversation in in our chat room. And um, two of the people in the chat room that I was in had experiences already, one who works in the Maine State Prison and 
So we were introducing ourselves, but there were some questions about um, the decline, you know, younger decline of health in people who are in prison um, and what, you know, kinds of things can be done to mitigate that or to work with that um, from the healthcare team that is there. Um, Brooke, I see a little nod of your nod of your head there. I'm not sure you want to answer it. Um, well, so I think um, something that's been coming up in the chat quite a bit is just the incredible amounts of trauma that folks who end up in custody have experienced um, and how I'm always sort of thinking about how that's influenced the timing um, and just the intensity of the complex issues that we face medically, psychiatrically, um, all together. So, you know, thinking about um, how to, you know, support that um, population, I think, is also adding the behavioral health component mm -hmm. um, and providing support from that level as well, simultaneous to the, the medical care as well. Hey, thank you for that. Others from the comments from the chat, our main takeaway from this was gratitude for Leo and his participation. Leo, I think you've got a fan club going here. Um, but just hearing the, the felt experience, the real experience, um, I think a lot of people have valued that very, very much. And, and you made a comment in the chat earlier, I hope you don't mind me mentioning it, that Although there is a lot of trauma and loss, there are efforts to, to work with people who are in prison and to, uh, you, I think you use the term, mitigate the impacts. And I don't know if you wanted to comment on that at all. Sure, yeah, thank you. And I actually spoke about it in our breakout group that there are give this current administration um, a whole lot of credit for their participatory approach to governance, where um, recently the medical subcommittee of the resident advisory council, where it was resident driven, the creation line for residents to be able to call to help address the breakdown in communication that has historically been one of the biggest issues with medical care in carceral spaces. Um, and we also helped shape the an aftercare survey that is now being handed out after each provider visit um, to, to provide direct feedback to WellPath um, of how the care is going. And that's um, representative of a lot of different initiatives that have been going on in the department recently. Uh, so I definitely uh, wanted to uplift that because that gives hope and provides space for residents to build agency, which is necessary for success at reentry to society. Thank you so much, Leo. I like the terminology of agency that people can get skills and build resilience um, and use the term hope. And I think that's quite an important term. I, I, I wonder if anyone else, Commissioner Liberty or Dr. Newby or anyone on, on our panel want to comment on uh, what was just asked. No pressure. I think the only thing that I can add, uh, a little bit of context to that, is that um, Leo certainly, is, as he so eloquently um, made mention of, um, this advisory uh, committee um, created uh, this self-driven um, question and, and we responded. Um, uh, and it gives us direct dialogue and feedback. And I think it's important to recognize that this is similar to how it is out in the society. I and mean, when we see our providers in the community and um, we have the abilities to interact with them and give them an update as to how the care was that, that you received under, under um, that caregiver. Great, so thank you for that. I do have one more. Chris, I hope I have time for one more question from the chat, because I think it's an important one, which is one group talked about the, the ways in which prison and people who are in prison are portrayed on television um, and the bias and stigma there is out there around who, who these people are, 
um, what their capabilities are and um, the impacts of those kinds of stereotypes. Um, that really wasn't a question, it was really a comment, but if, if anybody wants to respond to that before we go back to presentations, let's, um, I just wanna ask. Commissioner I, I would Lai. just say that, yeah, I'd just like to say that um, they are just like you and I, just like you and I. And um, the manners that are in our care are uh, there for mental health, substance use disorder, trauma, neglect, poverty, you know, living in an antisocial sort of environment as they were raised, all of that, um, just like the rest of us. And so, um, you know, we try um, to, to have a, an environment of um, non-adversarial sort of uh, role between staff and, and the residents. We all live there. It's a, trying to promote wellness and uh, respect and dignity and normalize the environment. We have a really nice initiative um, where Leo lives right now. It's the Earned Living Unit. It's unsupervised, uh, sort of, and uh, they come and go as they please, and they've earned that. And so, uh, it uh, as as you've heard uh, Leo say a few times, um, it provides hope. And so, someone entering into the the, the correctional system can see where um, you know people that uh, want to do good time and learn and grow and uh, aspire to be better. Uh, there are awards, and um, I've seen significant transformation and growth in so many folks that I would have no problem uh, living next to. And so uh, they're just like us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to um, move on. But before we do so, just a reminder that, you know, we're talking about people who are in prison, and we are also respect the needs of people and families and who have family members in prison as well. So Ruth, I pass it on to you. Thank you. Boy, it's, you know, we could spend so much time in all of these things, all of these discussions. But um, so right now I have the pleasure of introducing um, a couple of people I work very closely with. Um, Veronica Grady is an RN. Um, she does a lot, but I would say that her, she's a Department of Corrections employee and her focus is on clinical evaluation. So B Veronica, prior to coming into the Department of Corrections has a vast experience in, um, in working with older adults in, um, in care situations. And so it's wonderful to have her part of this conversation today. Also, Tyler Helms, he's the Regional Director um, of Operations for WellPath, a relatively new to Maine and incredibly quick learner. And he comes to us with a wealth of experience in corrections medicine. So, you know, Veronica and Tyler, I'd like to invite you to be part of this conversation. I have a few questions in all honesty to the listening audience. Um, Tyler and Veronica help put these questions together. But <laughs> um, so I guess Veronica, first I'd ask, uh, you know, what are some of the healthcare resources that you see that are available to the aging population in the community? And are they available to, um, to the folks who are in our prisons? In the community, there's a vast list and I am definitely in the time that we have not gonna be able to mention them all, but there are resources available in the community that can help guide people the aging population to resources that are available to them. Those would be things such as the main office of aging and disability services. They kind of umbrella a whole lot of different services that they can guide our elderly to. Um, then there's some direct services, home health, um, assisted living units, nursing home units, skilled living, skilled nursing units. So there are a vast majority of services. When a person comes into prison, all of these services are available, however, not in the sense that they are in the community. You don't go to a skilled facility to receive skilled services after a fracture, you get that in our infirmary. So our medical staff are required to provide all of those services. Um, things such as the Office of Aging and Disability, that has to be, the things that they might coordinate for someone in the community, 
that responsibility falls on our unit managers, our nurses and our physicians to try to figure out what our provider might require. Veronica, and um, I'm wondering, you know, what are some of the barriers to accessing health care um, for the elderly in the community and in prison? And I'm actually going to ask if you could really focus more on the prisons in just the interest of time. Okay. And really, it can be summed up in lack of professionals to provide the multitude of services for both community and for in prison. Um, in prison, you have the nurses, you have the providers, you have the mental health services, but there's not enough of them. Same thing that is occurring in the community at this time. Yeah, and I would say, just to add to that, that's not because that's our desire. That, you know, our contract with WellPath certainly provides for um, those positions to be there. WellPath works very yes. hard at hiring um, people to fill those roles. And this is just, if anyone reads the newspaper, you know, this is a very difficult time to recruit healthcare, um, healthcare professionals. But I also just want to take a second to add that, you know, in, in our breakout room, one of the things discussed was lack of knowledge of correctional medicine and that it's even out there. So, you know, I'm thrilled to be a part of something to, that lets people know we're out there. Thanks, Veronica. Um, so Tyler, you know, how are you currently, how do you see that we're currently caring for the aging population in prison? Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Um, and I would just piggyback off that, Veronica. I didn't know. So I got uh, a job with WellPath out of as an internship uh, out of college, and I had no clue or even thought of uh, medicine in corrections. So it was a really eye-opening experience. Um, but so currently caring for the aging population, we try to be as proactive as possible. So just like out in the community, as all of you would are trying to be proactive and going to your your primary care uh, physician. Um, we try to be proactive in that as well, where we do annual physicals. Um, we have, if you have a chronic care um, disease, we see you every 90 to 100 days um, to make sure that we're staying on top and seeing if there are any anything new going on with, with your health. Um, we also have an assisted living unit uh, and a hospice unit, which uh, Leo touched on earlier. So, so Tyler, with the increase in the average age in prison, well, in Maine, but in prison, um, how will healthcare needs um, need to adjust for us to be able to provide that adequate care as, as our folks are aging? Yeah, thanks, Ruth. Um, so I looked at a little data as well. And um, in 2015, 11% uh, of the population in Maine was 55 years or older. Uh, that number is currently up to 16%. Um, so in, what, seven years, we've seen a 5% increase. So when we're looking at that data, um, we're going to have to look at expanding the assisted living, un living unit spaces um, so we can care for more residents. Uh, we're also going to have to look at our hospice services and with, um, as we... As we know, when you're when you start getting older, start getting more medical conditions, um, the natural progression of life um, leads to hospice needs. So that's going to be um, something that we have to focus on. And then we also want to look at the possibility of having nursing home level care at a facility, um, because that is probably going to be needed in the in the future as well. You know, I would love to chat with the two of you so much longer about these issues, and um, I'll have the opportunity, but the, um, the folks who are part of this today won't because it's time to move on. But thanks very much, um, Veronica Thank and Tyler. Thanks. Thank you. So with that, um, I'm now going to turn this over to Dr. Razi Ali. Um, I have all kinds of wonderful things I could say about um, about Dr. Ali, but I, I'm gonna cut that short and just let you know that, um, trust me, he's wonderful. He has an incredible background. He is our regional medical director. I have the pleasure of working with him quite regularly. On top of all of his credentials and background, he's just 
he is a very kind and a very smart and um, man. And um, it's just, it's wonderful working with him. So it's his turn now. And I hope that, um, that Dr. Ali, you could just say something for a moment about why of all the kinds of medicine you got involved in, you decided to get involved in corrections medicine. Uh, thank you for those kind words, Ruth. Uh, my name is Ruzzy, like fuzzy with an R. And I want to, first of all, uh, say good afternoon to everyone and talk a little bit about my background. I am an internal medicine trained physician um, who initially was working in the hospital and was well acquainted with value-based care and actually worked with a large commercial insurance helping care for Medicare and Medicaid populations. For me, I wanted to help our society at large in a broader way and to also be humanistic about how we provide care. And as I thought to myself, what can I do as an individual? I looked to my surrounding community and decided that I wanted to help by actually improving the medical department at a large regional jail that serves my county. And it had a reputation that was not as stellar. And I wanted to help culture change it, elevate the level of care, and be a part of a mission and be a public servant. And so that's actually what brought me to correctional medicine, because I truly believe that individuals are at the, at the, you know, at the end of the day, we are all the same. And how we care for each other and how we do it, if we do it well, will impact not only that person's outcomes, but also can be done in a cost-effective manner that can help save taxpayer dollars. And so when we look at it from all different facets, there's so much good that can be had if we work in correctional health. And so that's what brought me to, to corrections. So I know we've been sitting around for about an hour or so, we're probably getting sleepy. Some people are drinking some coffee and get some caffeine, but let me just step back and talk to you a little bit about the perspective of carceral health and corrections in general. Every day we have over 2 million individuals that are incarcerated in the US. That's within jails and in prisons. And 10% of those individuals are 55 and older. And that number is increasing. Over the past 30 years, we have had over a 400% increase in the number of individuals that are 55 and older. And there are many reasons for that, which I will not go into, however, but this is a growing segment. Next slide, please. And so, you know, how do we provide health in the correctional space? You know, oftentimes we think, well, I'm sick. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and call my doctor's office, schedule an appointment, give them my insurance or figure out a payment plan and go see them. Well, you know, do we provide medical care in prisons and in jails? You know, do we just bandage people up and provide basic CPR? And the answer really lies in this landmark US Supreme Court case in 1976 in Estelle versus Gamble, which gave the constitutional right for residents to have adequate health care. And adequate health care is traditionally considered the community standard of care. We are no different on the inside as we are on the outside. And that is what we strive to do. We strive to have a proactive, integrated, whole person model where the resident is at the center of what we do. And that it is that mission and that like-mindedness that brings individuals to care for residents. And so the next slide, please. And so we try to surround our residents by a consortium of individuals to provide different levels of care in different capacities. We have providers that are physicians, that are APRNs, like our nurse practitioners and our physician assistants. We have dentists, we have oral facial surgeons, we have physical therapists, we have nurses, whether it be registered nurses, LPNs, medical assistants, CNAs. We have therapists. 
We have telehealth services that are brought to the resident, all to help care for them in place. We also have the ability to consult out for specialty care to go see your heart doctor, the nephrologist, the lung doctor. This is a part of whole person care, taking care of the individual. And so one may think to themselves, well, how do I actually get in touch with the medical side? Well, within the prison world, there are many different touch points. And the next slide gives a list of some of the samplings of how residents can come in contact with those that are in the health and, and sorry, that are in the clinic, which is centrally located. We have initial intakes, we have annual exams, we have sick call visits, we have dental appointments, MSUD for those that have opioid use dependency. We provide care for transgender individuals, have optometry. We also do work release physicals and we bring imaging and physical therapy on site to help care for one another like the way we would on the outside. Next slide, please. And so as I you know, talk through this scenario, I wanted to map the pathway an individual can take to interact with our healthcare clinic and the individuals in healthcare when they're within the prison. And so this is a little mind map and it starts off with an initial intake. Once someone comes into a correctional facility, they are met by a registered nurse who reviews the medical problems, the medications that they're on, ask about the behavioral health conditions, as well as their use of recreational drugs and gets that initial input and gets them in our system. It is soon then followed up by an initial behavioral health provider seeing that individual to address many of the conditions that our residents have that are in higher proportion than the general community due to the stresses and certain environmental circumstances. Shortly after that, within a two week period, we have a medical provider see our patients in person where we help take care of and identify potential conditions and get labs to see if there are any conditions that they didn't know about. There have been countless individuals that have had hepatitis C, that have had diabetes, hyperlipidemia that we have picked up on on this initial annual exam. And that individual will then go back to their housing unit, live their day to day, and then they put in a sick call to say, hey, I have opioid use disorder that wasn't identified by my initial behavioral health intake. I want to be started on Suboxone. And so they have an MSUD visit where they come talk to a provider and get started on buprenorphine or Suboxone. That same individual will then later on follow up for a chronic care visit, whether it be related to the MSUD or be related to a medical condition they have, such as COPD. Now this resident, as all of us do, let's say they get a virus and they're saying, I don't feel well. They place a sick call, they get added to a provider list and they have a sick call visit. And just like on the outside, we are swabbing for COVID. They get swabbed for COVID, get swabbed for flu. We make sure that these individuals do not have those conditions. And if they do, we appropriately treat. But let's say that this resident who has COPD has a virus and say, I'm feeling a little wheezy, a little short of breath. We check their vitals. They have a little temperature of 100. Their oxygen is a little bit lower at about 94%. And they sure are wheezy. So we talk to them and have shared decision-making and talking about, should we move that individual to our infirmary? In our infirmary for practical purposes is our place for peri-hospital care. Individuals that may need to go to the hospital or those that may come back from the hospital, we help care for them there in the infirmary. And while they're in the infirmary, we give them IV steroids. We give them nebulizers Q for hours while they're awake. We provide them with antibiotics. And after about 24 or 48 hours, um, and you know, monitoring them with our nurse that's there, CNA. We then have a provider see them and see if they are right to go back to their general population. And then they are, and they have a follow-up visit within a few days 
or within a few weeks. I also want to say that it's highly important along this pathway for the resident that as they get closer to their release, that we work hand in hand with making sure if that individual is not having insurance when they leave, that we fill out the paperwork for main care, for Medicaid. That is hugely important. And transitions of care to make sure that that individual has a follow-up with a PCP or an individual provider that can provide them with buprenorphine that is there when they leave. These are hugely important things that we have been, uh, that's been ushered in under the tutelage and guidance of the MDOC. And so we're truly proud of that. And so, you know, as we have this aging population, like how do we deal with this? You know, we have individuals that are becoming more frail, have complex medical conditions that are complex and interact with one another. They're on a slew of medications. Their ability to do activities of daily living are compromised. Well, we have the ability to provide things like canes, rolling walkers, wheelchairs. We have handicap accessible cells. And we have our assisted living unit. And we have a coordinated way where we scale individuals based on their condition, their comorbidities, how functionally decreased they are, how much nursing help they need to get them into our assisted living unit. And that's an area that we can improve upon by having a larger number of residents possible to be there. And at that assisted living unit, we have a RN and we have a CNA to help provide that care. Also, we've talked about the infirmary and the hospice with Leo. And I just wanna say thank you so much for everyone for listening. Um, I know I've run over a little bit of my time. And the last thing I wanna say is women's health has been really important to our care that we provide here. We help take care of individuals from uh, entry to the end during pregnancy as well. And women's uh, health, reproductive health is hugely important to us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brooke Berard. Um, and I'm the Regional Behavioral Health Director for WellPath in the MDOC, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm particularly thrilled to be here because I love what I do. I feel very lucky to say that, and, um, and the reason I ended up in the correctional world um, is because towards the end of grad school, where it seems like some of you are, I didn't know exactly um, which direction I wanted to go in. I, I loved crisis services. Um, I also really wanted to engage in ongoing, in-depth, processing, um, counseling. Um, there was a lot of populations I really wanted to work with. And so um, I found my home in corrections. Um, it enables me to continue to work um, with all these different populations and engage in my skills from everything from stabilization to um, really just working through um, the trauma um, and, and working and programming um, for long-term. So so I'm happy, I'm happy to be here this afternoon. I'm happy to hear that um, there's some interest in, um, in this population. So um, I, I just wanna share with you guys that um, although we're, we're seeing this um, large increase in our elderly population in custody, um, one might say, is there an elderly crime wave? Um, and the answer is no, at least not in the United States. Um, we typically have folks who have been incarcerated for long sentences, not necessarily those who are newly incarcerated as elderly. Um, so there's an impact on mental health from long-term incarceration, as you can imagine. And then also there's um, institutionalization. So are they getting sort of enmeshed and immersed too much so in this environment? And do we need to focus kind of on um, how can they independently continue to thrive um, outside of this world when they re-enter into the community after being with us for such a long period of time? Um, and also just thinking about what it means for this group in particular in terms of programming, such as coming to terms with ending their life um, while being in custody or reintegrating after being disconnected for so long from the community. Um, so those are some of the considerations that we take in, into, um, into account. When we think about risk assessment, which we often do in behavioral health, um, you know, age is protective. So typically, even if you're a career criminal, um, you age out of crime. Um, the older you get, the less likely you are to reoffend and return. Uh, the arrest rate over 50 is about 2% and gets to almost zero by the time you're 65 or older. So, you know, when we're thinking about public health um, or public safety concerns, 
it's a really low number for this um, population to be um, considered at risk um, and, and such. So as it was mentioned, um, we have, you know, 14 to 16% that um, are considered elderly in our population, over 300, and just about half of that population has at least one major mental illness. Most commonly in our system is depression, some kind of psychotic disorder, and anxiety. Um, we have an intensive mental health unit that is almost like a um, psychiatric hospital within the prison setting, very unique to our system. Um, and when thinking about that population, just about 20% or so um, are considered elderly there as well. Um, folks that we identify as special needs um, under behavioral health are those that require more intensive services, um, may need to see us more frequently, um, they just need uh, more support, and just about 30% of that population is also elderly. Um, and then the assisted living unit that was mentioned as well, about 80% has a mental health diagnosis. Next slide, please. So you can see here, um, for, for those of you just becoming familiar with this setting, those who have a mental illness are up to four times more likely to be incarcerated. So many times we consider our prisons and jails as um, sort of the new psychiatric hospital, and we really do house a number of folks who are really suffering. Um, the items in red here are the diagnoses that are even um, higher in rates for the elderly population. So you can see depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, and personality disorders. These are diagnoses that um, are higher in rates for our 50 plus um, population incarcerated. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so as it was mentioned earlier, we're very proud of the work that we're doing for medications for substance use disorder, as well as the co-occurring counseling services that we're providing. Um, we offer universal access to these services. So everyone in our facility, they don't have to wait until they get closer to the release, which is often the case in other systems. Um, currently, right now, about 10% of the population are receiving um, MSED services with us are considered elderly. Um, and we're finding in the community and within our system that there's an increasing number of elderly individuals with OUDs, um, opioid use disorders, and um, that we've seen that actually go up about three times as much in the last 10 years. So it's certainly something that we've been um, experiencing in our system as well. Although currently alcohol use disorder is the most common in our older population. Uh, buprenorphine appears to have less side effects than other prescription um, opioids and requires less intensive management. So it's been effective in treating both OUDs and pain in this population. Um, we do keep in mind that, you know, the older population is taking at least one prescription medication, so there's always the increasing risk of interactions as well. Um, but also, interestingly, just in terms of drug-related and traumatic mortality rates, um, there's not a decline with age. And then we also have the chronic diseases to contend with as well. Uh, next slide, please. So suicide rates in the world, actually, when we think about rates, um, it's, it's really, um, as you get older, this increases. So in the general U.S. and world population, 60 and older has the highest rate of suicide-related deaths um, in the non-incarcerated population. When we think about the risks to this population, it's really, um, you know, there's less flexibility. Once you get older, there's a disconnection from others, as we can all imagine, um, the physical health problems, disabilities in daily living, and overall attention, uh, depression, particularly, um, you know, sort of this loneliness. Um, then when we think about those who are in custody, um, we at 55 and higher is the highest rate of suicide. Um, so when you're looking at numbers alone, they may not re represent the highest, but when we're looking at rates, they are the most at risk. Um, so in our prison system, it's about 9% across the country. And, you know, there really is similar risk factors with this population that there is in the community, but the ones that really stand out um, in incarcerated is really that the physical ailments come earlier than anticipated, as we were just talking about, and also just the hopelessness. Um, so really trying to instill hope in this population is a tremendous challenge for us um, in supporting these residents. 
Um, and then also interesting to know just the, the research done on the ratio of attempts of suicide um, to completed. So in the general population, um, younger population, it's about 25 to one. So every 25 attempts, there's a completed suicide. But with the elderly population, that's about four to one. Um, so that's you know something that's notable for us to be considering. And then um, older adults tend to choose more lethal means um, and have greater determination to die and also can be harder to save at times. Um, the other thing that our teams are really mindful of is that this is the one population that's less likely to express suicidal ideation prior to committing suicide. So it's um, over 70% or so will be mentioning um, suicidal ideation uh, within the week before they commit suicide, just statistically, but this population is um, significantly less. Um, and that's it. So next slide there, I think, and uh, I believe it hands it back to Shelly. Thank you. It does. Thank you so much, Brooke. That was so informative. And so now we'll have our final breakout session. And um, we're really interested to hear, you know, what have you learned particularly about the impact on aging when you're in the prison system and some of the exigencies of that, and particularly around mental health, which is really powerful piece you've just presented, Brooke. How might you apply this to your future practice? We've seen a lot of people talking about you know, this is new exposure to them. And of course we have seasoned professionals here in the audience as well. And once again, be ready to share your impressions. We're not gonna do a debrief after this. We're gonna do a Q and A. Um, and uh, Chris is putting these questions in the chat. So um, let's get into our breakout rooms for our final um, time together. Please put your questions in the chat. I'm, uh, one of the questions that I had, and I'll just start right off here and, and then I'll get to Jennifer Cedis, um, is, is about ageism in, in prisons. You know, ageism is so rampant in the United States. Uh, you know, I know we have people here who are from other countries, but it is so rampant in the United States. It, do you see any of that in the prison setting? Carol, you're nodding. I don't know who you are, but hi, welcome. Um, but um, can any of you shed some light on that in the prison population? Randy, I wonder if you could speak to that, uh, Commissioner Liberty. Yes, I, I think there is, is some of that. Um, unfortunately, in, an environment, in a correctional environment, sometimes uh, um, vulnerable populations are, are preyed upon a bit, and so I've seen some of that. Um, but the, the key, I think, with, uh, for us is to create an environment of wellness and hope and positivity and uh, fair treatment for all. And so it's important for the officers to maintain that, that level of, uh, assure there's a level of respect there. But generally speaking, um, there's, there's great respect for, for elders, I think, in the, in the resident population overall. Um, there are circumstances where that's not the case, but Generally speaking, there's good respect and, and care for one another. Thank you. One of the questions that I saw also and heard also, and again, I'm watching you for your questions as, as well, is how, how is dementia being addressed? And I know we have Tom Muser here also, who um, is working with Mountain View folks around dementia education, but can some of the providers uh, speak to how dementia is being addressed and, and what you're looking for in terms of services and help? Brooke, could you speak to that? Yeah, sure. I think um, one of the ways it's being addressed is that we know that we need to be providing more resources towards the increasing you know, prevalence that we're seeing. Um, and in particular, just working um, to sort of like what Tyler had said is, um, you know, recognizing when we need to pr be providing additional assessment, when we need to be seeing what's, you know, um, that this is a time that they really need additional services and just making sure that we are connecting with those individuals as early on as possible so that we can provide them with supportive services. So I think, um, you know, similar to what's happening in the community, we're just realizing that it is, um, you know, increasingly becoming an issue that we need to um, we need to provide support for in our system. Thank you. Anyone else want to add to that before I move on? You know, I'll say that 
um, you know, there is so much that goes on in the, um, in the correction system and so many different issues. And I'm not sure that this has been at the top. I know it's not been at the top because there are so many issues to be dealing with. And I think recently we've realized that this needs to be um, paid attention to. And so I'll say in all honesty, this, this is an area of improvement for us um, to be addressing. And we're doing that in part with the work that we're doing with um, the UNE team and what Tom User is doing um, with us. Um, I mean, a great Alzheimer's program that he just um, was able to work with our um, folks up at Mountain View to put together. But there's, there's a lot more we could do. I thought, Scott, did you unmute? Did you want to add something? Yeah, just real quick. Um, one thing that's important to mention about corrections work is the collaborative relationship that exists between the medical staff, the behavioral health staff, and the security staff, and, you know, and the residents even. So with folks that have dementia, one really important component that's developed to sort of work through the progression of dementia has been training and, and involving residents to do things like queuing and assisting people through their routines and just, you know, these are their peers, they're almost their family in certain circumstances. And they're many of them very capable. And so you bring in medical staff, you can train some of our residents and they can, they can provide a, a tremendous impact to those with dementia and they benefit from providing that kind of care and support. Um, so it, I think it's a real key piece of sort of managing that subset in our population. Thank you so much, Scott. Tom, did you want to add anything at all? Yeah, I'll just, I just dropped uh, the link to the um, sessions that we just offered uh, from Mountain View. And I, will, I, I have, was just blown away by the, the interest, the honest interest and the real passion for learning about this topic. The Helping Hands group joined us in a large room. And um, this, these are, these are you know, residents trained kind of like CNAs to provide support to their fellow uh, residents in need. And the questions they asked and the personal connection to the material was um, better than I ever get in the community when I speak on this topic. So kudos to, um, to the Mountain View team. Thank you, Tom. Sorry putting you on the spot there, but there we go. So I wanna make sure Jennifer C's question is her. Jennifer, do you wanna ask it yourself? Um, are you willing to uh, unmute? Sorry about that, I was connecting to power when you asked me to. Yeah, I just am just blown away by the lack of um, representation for in Healthy People 2030. And so I was just curious, besides the fact that we do value certain populations over others, can anyone shed some light on why this population tends to not be a part of these objectives and also the setting? when we know there's so much work to be done and how that national prioritization does drive funding and implementation of programs. That's a fabulous question. Who would like to field that question, Ruth? Um, well, I'll, I'll just say that I certainly I'm familiar with the, um, with the Healthy People. I worked on Healthy People 2010 and such back when I worked at the um, Center for Disease Control here in Maine. Um, why is corrections not part of it? I don't know. And that is a good question. And I think that in the last you know, bit of time, we've been overwhelmed with working with COVID and trying to keep people healthy. And I think it's time um, that we reach out and see what role we may be able to play in that. Anyone the healthy, wanna... the health, I was just saying, the healthy people, um, you know, objectives and such, generally are, don't, don't reach into specialized populations like um, corrections, but it, that's not a universal statement. And, um, and I think you bring up a good point. Yeah, really important point. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Gina, Mealy, would you like to ask your question? Um, I am a first year in the OT program here at UNE. Um, and my question was really about volition and motivation to seek care. Um, I typed it here if anyone um, already read it, but just palliative care is a right to all clients as, as is the right to refuse 
treatment. Um, can you guys just talk about a little bit about motivation and volition um, as it pertains to residents, um, especially if they already know that they're aging in prison and through end of life care? I wonder if Leo may be able to say a few things. Sure. So Candace Powell is on this um, and she is the woman who really helped facilitate and teach the process of learning how to heal and learn how to love in a healthy way and to be present um, for people near the end of their life and how important it is to center the patient's needs, the human being's needs. And that comes down to volition. It comes down to empowering them to do whatever it is that they are still able to do near the end of their life, right? It's always about asking that question, who's meeting whose needs? When you are down there in that infirmary, who are you there for? Are you there for you or are you there for the patient? And when it comes to end of life care, and they, they can accept hospice care, they can deny it, or, or they can uh, accept it and then say, listen, I want to be alone and kick us out of the room. And that's, that's totally okay, too. Um, and, and that has actually happened. Um, so so the, the patient's voice is key. Um, and, you know, there, there are, for general medical care, um, there, you are called up for whatever your appointment is. And you can uh, you can deny care, and you, you need to sign a, a refusal slip in order to do that. But you do have that choice. Thank you, Leo. This is Chris from UNE. I'm having to bring the event to a close now. We're at the end of our time. I want to especially thank everyone from the MDOC and from Wellpath and Leo as well for your time today. I hope that everyone will take a moment to complete the attendance form. And we've put the contact information for Ruth and uh, John in the chat if you wish to get in contact with them. We'd love to have you join us on March 24th. We'll have a presentation in concert with the art gallery about um, how architects are also essential healthcare workers. And students will have a choice, chance to gather on Saturday, March 26th for the leadership conference. I thank you all for being here today. I hope we, I know that we had a really fantastic event and great engagement in the chat. And we hope to see you again next time. Thank you. <laughs>